Cultural Appreciation versus Appropriation. This lecture was originally delivered as part of the Embracing Differences to Make a Difference Professional Development Seminar at the University of Montana on September 15, 2018. The topic of cultural appreciation and its counterpart cultural appropriation is rather controversial these days. And so my aim here is to discuss the topic broadly, discuss some of its history, and uh, through a number of individual case studies discuss possible solutions to what is essentially a controversial issue in contemporary culture. To begin with, I think it's important to understand that there are different notions of the nature of culture. The two dominant notions are one, that culture is static. That is, that cultures are essentially fixed. These tend to be called essentialist or even nationalist models. The second notion is that culture is in fact dynamic, that it is ever changing, evolving, and sometimes devolving. And I would admit that after 28 years of teaching art history and criticism, I tend to subscribe to the latter. Now, before we talk about whether in fact culture is dynamic or static, it's important to understand that there are unique cultures, traditional societies all around the world that have their own languages, core beliefs, and ways of life. And that these societies are under assault and essentially fighting for survival today. These societies deserve the world's attention, its respect, and protection. Often the victims of persistent harassment and even willful extermination, traditional societies have integrity, rich cosmologies, and profound wisdom that they can offer us in what is essentially a broken and divided post-industrial world. These traditional societies are entitled to self-determination and autonomy, to be left alone if that is indeed what they wish. Some of these societies are actually quite famous, quite well known, quite well documented, and other societies are essentially um, living on their own, and in some cases in opposition to the modern world. But for most of these uh, groups, these are proud peoples with rich cultures and with dramatic and iconic histories. That said, change is historic. We have to understand that history, both internal and external to traditional societies, teaches us that change and evolution are not only historical, but oftentimes required, expected, and embraced. It's important also to note that, that who drives the change in the modern world, whether these are internal dynamics or external pressures on traditional societies. I want to talk about one case study. And this is the, ca the, uh, the case of the Aztec Empire in ancient Mexico, a society that in some ways understood change, embraced change, expected change. What we're looking at here in these two images is one, a reconstruction on the right of the city of Tenochtitlan, that is the imperial capital, and this was the ritual center of the city, ritual and political center with its palaces, its temples, um, places of worship and gathering. And it was there where the image that you see there on the left was discovered. This is, of course, the famous solar disk, a, an enormous large block of stone that was discovered uh, at the foot of uh, Mexico City's cathedral. But it was once in the sacred precinct at ancient Tenochtitlan. And this image, which has become a kind of iconic symbol of the Aztec Empire, shows us how for this indigenous society, change was indeed a part of life and a normal expected part of life. This image is a calendar. And of course, it is a combination of both a 365 day solar calendar, but also a ritual calendar. And more than that, historians tell us that the image also records epic time, that is large cycles of creation and destruction that the Aztecs believe preceded them. So for example, the central image of the face that we have there of the rising sun has adjacent to it four cartouches. And in these four boxes, we find four glyphs that represent the dates upon which the Aztec world or the ancient world was created and destroyed. And the Aztecs believed in historic times, that is in the, early, in the late uh, 15th and early 16th century, that they were at the end of an age and that in fact great destruction was in fact coming. That destruction would come in the, in the shape of earthquakes and other natural disasters. 
but indeed that their order, their world, would come to a close. And that's essentially what the image represents in the middle. That is the five great sons, or the five great creations uh, and destructions of the Aztec world. So change was inherent, and it was in fact an integral part of that society. It's in fact something that not only was expected, but something that came to fruition in the uh, 16th century when the Spanish Empire destroyed and conquered the Aztec Empire. So change in traditional societies is indeed natural. Traditional societies constantly change, they adapt, and they evolve, often in relation to their neighbors, their trading partners, their rivals, and their conquerors. Sometimes they distinguish themselves against their rivals, but sometimes they assimilate their neighbors' ways. And this cultural change is, is persistent in traditional societies. We must also recognize that often traditional societies are forced to change by conquest, that is, by forces external to these societies. Let me give you another example of a society that understood uh, change. This is a view, two views, of ancient Teotihuacan. On the left we have a large view of the city center with the Great Pyramid, uh, called the Pyramid of the Sun there in the distance, and the valley as it spreads out around it. This city was densely populated, one of the largest cities in the Americas in ancient times. Sometime between the year 100 and, 17, uh, and 750, the city became a major pilgrimage site. And it's also remarkable that it was built uh, in probably less than 200 years with a very, very consistent style. The Teotihuacanos, this ancient people, um, in fact understood that architecture, and urbanism could be used to describe their, not only their aesthetics, but also their worldview. The city is perceived today as a large cosmogram that is in some ways arti that articulates their worldview in, the uh, in the physical realm. It's also interesting that there at Teotihuacan, there were foreigners. There were in fact ambassadors from uh, rival states and other uh, kingdoms to the south. And their architecture was radically different. In other words, whereas the Teotihuacanos used rectilinear uh, architecture with distinctive profiles to their, uh, their uh, uh, pyramids and their temples and their apartment complexes, the neighbors um, who lived here used their own ar architecture. And therefore, these societies distinguished themselves through architecture and in fact acknowledged that they were different from their neighbors. So change and uh, change is persistent and, uh, and constant, even among traditional societies. I would argue that, uh, that understanding societies as changing, uh, as dynamically changing, is important today, mostly because static notions of culture are dangerous. The idea is that cultures are fixed, that can't evolve, can't change, originated after 1492, and they tended to heat up in the Enlightenment, the so-called Age of Reason, and, the, and in the Industrial Revolution, when Western empires were actively colonizing and exploiting the Third World. Western powers tended to see the dark peoples of the world as primitives, somehow frozen in an earlier state of human development. Europe, and increasingly America, perceived traditional societies as earlier developmental moments in human history, and these, uh, more primitive states needed to be overcome or eradicated, uh, and, and they refused to see traditional societies around the world as people with agency who lived in harmony with the planet and with each other. Essentially, these are racist ideas that hold that some communities, mainly non-Europeans, dark-skinned peoples, are essentially incapable of change and are particularly inept at living in the modern world. And therefore, the solution is to, in fact, educate them. They need white, white people, Western Europeans, to lead them out of darkness, or, if they resist, to destroy them altogether. And this is a, a pattern that we see in, in human history, particularly in the last 500 years. It's not a unique pattern. This has, of course, played itself out in other uh, societies around the world in human history. But it really has exacerbated in the last 500 years, since the coming of Europeans to the New World, to the Americas, and um, 
what they perceived as the new world, and since the shrinking of the world uh, over the last half millennium. This is an image that comes from a cigar box that shows us, in fact, how the United States has been among the leaders in that, uh, in that world view. There's an image of Uncle Sam with the American Eagle, in fact, um, towering over or looming over the darker peoples of the world that need um, his direction, if you will. Now, some of the more egregious notions that societies are inferior and static and ill-equipped to live in the modern world uh, can be seen in the posters that you see here, where a number of communities have been signaled as less than modern, less than developed, and therefore uh, worthy of extermination. Probably the most egregious example of this is uh, the treatment of American Indians, the native indigenous peoples of uh, this continent by Europeans over the last 500 plus years. And that is an argument, by the way, that continues to rage in American society today. So the triumphant West certainly appreciates the world beyond its borders. But it does it on its own terms, which tend to often be racist and patronizing. The West has consistently misrepresented others and twisted history in its favor, often selecting cultural elements from the non-West for its own ideological aims. This is a form of cultural appreciation. The West clearly appreciates the rest of the world. But in its more malevolent forms, this appreciation smells an awful lot like cultural appropriation. That is a form of theft of a neighboring people's uh, culture. So I want to talk about some case studies here and explain how that uh, cultural appreciation can very easily slip into cultural appropriation. These are both images that show African materials removed mostly out of tribal context, although some of this came out of kingdoms. But the majority of the work that we see here in both of these images came out of tribal context in the 19th century, when in fact European colonial powers, the French, the British, the Belgians, the Dutch, etc., were colonizing large uh, swaths of the African continent. As part of that colonization, much works, uh, much works of art and culture were removed from their original context, essentially looted or plundered, brought back to uh, Western European powers and put on display. And that's essentially what we see in that Belgian image on the left, a museum display in which materials were removed from Central Africa and uh, displayed for European eyes in, West, in, uh, in Belgium. These materials were essentially um, fed the interest and a great deal of appreciation on the part of Europeans for their colonial entities and the places and the cultures that they were colonizing. Uh, some would see this material as loot taken in punitive expeditions um, and, uh, and uh, looted, plundered from the societies that were essentially being conquered and exploited by Western powers. There's, uh, there's no denying that Europeans admired and, uh, and appreciated these cultures, but they also were in, in an active process of destroying them and removing their cultural artifacts and their significant religious and political um, objects. So these objects are indeed not just objects of appreciation, but also objects of cultural appropriation. The image on the lower right is a personal collection in the hands of an early modernist artist. And that represents another form of cultural appreciation and appropriation. The objects that you see here were greatly admired and appreciated, and in some cases mimicked by early modernist artists in France, in Belgium, Germany, etc. Artists appreciated these works of art as expressive, in some cases beautiful, as, um, as abstract, and that was of course a major value in the art of the late 19th and early 20th century. And they saw these, these objects as catalysts for Europeans' uh, own notions of abstraction. The problem here is that, of course, they appropriated these objects, purchased them in galleries, removed them out of their original context. And in the process of appreciating these objects, they left out a significant aspect of these objects. 
Most of them came out of a ritual context. A ritual context that had been altered, if not destroyed. That context, religious, philosophical, that cultural context, really meant very little to the artists who used these, these objects. They simply used them as aesthetic objects and aesthetic catalysts to their own journey and their own trajectories as visual artists. So in other words, they took what they needed from these societies and left what was significant to those societies aside uh, and ignored it. And in some cases actively helped a process of destruction. So for example, here we see the, works of, the work of Henri Matisse, a very famous portrait that is in modern day Russia today. Uh, this is uh, Matisse's portrait of his wife, Madame Matisse. The image, as you can see, is an abstraction. It's a portrait of Madame Matisse, but mostly it's a composition, lines, shapes, colors, etc. The catalyst for that abstraction were the masks that you see there on the right, these African masks that came from uh, the country of Gabon. Masks which Henri Matisse appreciated, but also appre appropriated for their expressive power for the power of abstraction, the design aspects that he saw and appreciated in, that, in those works of art. Again, leaving aside any kind of ritual connotations or historic or cultural traits um, that, were not, that were insignificant to uh, his abstracting uh, uh, endeavor. The same thing is true of this pivotal painting. This is, of course, Les Damoiselles d'Avignon, um, uh, Pablo Picasso's famous Cubist painting of 1907 which is considered by most art historians as the great catalyst that made Cubist art public and an, an important re-envisioning uh, re of representation in the Western world. And of course what we see here is a Western style image of a group of nudes in a landscape setting. But the nudes, as you can see, have been abstracted. That is, they've been stylized, in some cases made geometric, broken down into their geometric components and pieced back together in this uh, whimsical way. And of course, historians will tell you that uh, Picasso used a number of, uh, of cultural sources in, uh, in his aims to abstract. Some of those were European, particularly early European and Iberian um, uh, works of art. And some of those were indeed African, African masks, uh, particularly uh, what we see in the two figures on the right represent those, uh, those sources. Again, for Picasso, the, these masks catalyze his abstracting tendencies. Uh, he, they, they offered all kinds of possibilities in abstracting the human uh, figure, the human face, for expressive purposes. But of course, it's questionable whether Picasso cared at all about the cultural context in which those masks existed. Objects like these from the 19th century and the early 20th century, these in this case two photographs by Edward Curtis, show us a great deal of appreciation for traditional society. They in fact um, revel in their, in their difference from the modern world and from modern European and American ways. But there's also in Elan a certain melancholy a certain uh, longing for an idealized, romanticized world that was increasingly being destroyed in the, uh, in the Indian wars of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. So images like these, um, we have to acknowledge that in spite of their deep appreciation and sometimes respect for the traditional societies, that they in fact create an image of a society that was no more a society that in the views of modern Americans was being exterminated or extinguished. In fact, these images that you see here were often staged by the artist to in fact take us back nostalgically into a world, an idealized world that was constructed in the fantasy and the imagination of the Western mind. So we have to be careful that appreciation uh, not lead directly to appropriation. And that has a strong history and a long history in the Western world, beginning, in fact, with the coming of Europeans to the American continent in the late 15th century. I want to read to you a quotation written by Michel de Montaigne, the French man of letters, who wrote in the late, uh, in the late 16th century. He was a very, very popular essayist who wrote in his native French, but whose essays were very quickly translated 
and published in multiple Western European languages. And Michel de Montaigne uh, showed a distinct appreciation for uh, traditional societies, particularly American societies, even though he had actually never been to America. And that's what I want to read to you, a, a short quotation from an essay called On Cannibals. However, I would warn you that this essay in some ways froze notions of Americans, that is indigenous Americans, in the late 16th century. And these ideas, these cliches about the indigenous peoples of this continent persist in part uh, today. So here's Michel de Montaigne from his essay on cannibals writing in 1518. These nations then seem to me to be so far barbarous as having received but very little form and human invention, and consequently to be not much remote from their original simplicity. The laws of nature, however, govern them still, not as yet much vitiated with any mixture of ours, but to such purity that I am sometimes troubled we were not sooner acquainted with these people, and that they were not discovered in those better times when there were men much more able to judge them than we are. I should tell Plato that America is a nation wherein there is no manner of traffic, no knowledge of letters, no science of numbers, no name of magistrate or political superiority, no use of services, no riches or poverty, no contracts, no successions, no dividends, no properties, no employments, but those of leisure, no respect of kindred, but common, no clothing, no agriculture, no metal, no use of corn or wine, the very words that dignify lying, treachery, dissimulation, avarice, envy, detractions, pardon, never heard of. How much would he find his imaginary republic short of this perfection? So in this essay, what we have is this fantasy about the indigenous peoples of America. It's a fantasy, and it's also patently false. And yet these were the ideas that were spread across Europe uh, starting with 1492. There was not only great ignorance of the complexity and the richness of Ameri indigenous Americans and their world, but there was an attempt to basically turn them into less than human beings. Individuals who in fact had nothing, none of the accidents, none of the attributes of modern civilization. And these ideas unfortunately persist in our world today. These, I, these notions, in fact, are perceived in art history. If we look at Benjamin West's uh, famous painting of the death of General Wolfe in uh, Canada today, this was painted in 1771, we already have, in fact, an image that coalesces this idea of Americans as noble savages. For example, we see that the Europeans on the American continent fighting their wars are, in fact, the protagonists here. The light shines, the light of heaven shines down on their actions and their activities. The Indian is relegated to a participant and an observer. And we notice, in fact, the Indian there on the left. Benjamin West, as an American, took a great interest in, uh, in Native Americans, in the indigenous peoples of this continent. In fact, there's almost an archaeological attitude, an almost anthropological approach to that depiction of that, uh, the Indian in the lower left-hand uh, quadrant of the image. And yet the image, the Indian is perceived as not a participant in these, event, in these events, but rather as an observer, stoic, detached, romanticized even. And that image, in fact, of the Indian as less than active, less than participant, uh, less than an active participant or a protagonist in these images is actually a, a malignant image because it dehumanizes the Indian or it sees the Indian as in fact inferior. And that image could very easily turn. And in fact, that's indeed what art history shows us. That often the Indian was perceived not only as detached and separate, and if it's going to be a protagonist in the story, then it will be as a malevolent force. And that's what we see in this painting by John Vanderlyn, The Death of Jane McCrae. The Indian is in fact an impediment to progress. The Indian is in fact an, an impediment to the modernizing of the, uh, the American continent. So what is cultural appropriation? Well, it's the product of this colonialist hegemony that we've inherited in the modern world. And it is, of course, a topic of much de debate and resistance 
in our own time. Typically, cultural appropriation is when a dominant culture dictates its place to a subject people or a minority group, when it feels entitled to define the culture of the other and consumes that culture, if not altering uh, that culture of the other. The dominant group asserts it's privilege to use, interpret, deny, and sometimes erase the culture of the other. Our museums are filled with objects that in fact do precisely that. They represent the privileges of a dominant culture to use, interpret, to deny, and sometimes erase the culture of the other. Cultural appropriation means that the dominant group profits from another group's cultural identity. And by the way, all groups, including minorities, participate in this appreciation and appropriation spectrum. We must see appreciation as one end of the spectrum, maybe the benign aspect of the spectrum, and appropriation is the more malignant version of the spectrum. And one could argue that America, that is the United States of America, is the great appropriator. That for example, just think about African American music and how rock and roll, modern rock and roll, is in fact an appropriation. Early white rock and rollers took uh, African American music and Appalachian music, so from smaller uh, communities uh, in America, repackaged it, processed it, and profited from it, often giving very little credit to the cultures that generated uh, this uh, musical genre. Images like these, as beautiful as they are, as respected as they are, and in this case I'm showing you two uh, paintings by the German artist Winnold Reis, who came to America and spent a great deal of time in glacier country in uh, western Montana on the eastern front of the Rocky Mountains. Beautiful images like these can be seen not just as evidence of cultural appreciation, but also as evidence of cultural appropriation. The reason being that these, uh, these paintings have to be seen in a cultural context. They have to be seen in the context of the development of Glacier National Park early in the 20th century and the destruction of Blackfeet culture in the eastern front of the Rocky Mountains. Uh, Vinald Reis came to work at a Glacier Park at the behest of the man that you see there on the right in the suit, and that is uh, Lewis Hill, whose Great Northern Railway, in fact, used in, uh, iconic images of Indians to lure um, American citizens from the eastern seaboard and the Great Plains uh, to Glacier National Park and the west. Indians were, um, were depicted in a way that was friendly, welcoming, and used by the corporation, by the Great Northern Railway, to sell their product, and that is uh, the amenities, uh, that, the, uh, that the railway offered in the National Park and beyond. So the images by Rice can be seen as, yes, a, a, great, a great dose of cultural appreciation, sometimes for the richness of their anthropological attention to detail, the clothing, um, and the beautiful portraits of the Blackfeet peoples. But they must also be perceived as part of an endeavor to appropriate that culture and to use that culture for the profits of the, uh, the corporation. Probably the most egregious example of cultural appreciation to appropriation are the Indian mascots in, uh, in North American sports teams. I call this loving the Indian to death. And I think of the sports mascot as both a degree of appreciation and a great deal of appropriation. And this is, of course, one of the most controversial issues in, um, in American society today. A number of sports teams have changed their names, um, gotten rid of these mascots simply because they understand them to be offensive, demeaning, and the turning of entire societies and entire minority groups into, um, into a mascot. Um, many teams, however, and many um, around the country resist this temptation and argue that they are in fact uh, a deeply appreciative of heroic societies, heroic warriors, and, uh, and refuse to give up these, uh, these mascots. But it is true that for most uh, Native American groups around the country, of all tribes and all stripes, 
these images are seen as offensive because they're cliches and stereotypes uh, and um, uh, uh, of indigenous uh, culture and values. So these are um, just some of the examples of memes that show, in fact, the opposition or the resistance, the movement, in fact, to get rid of these uh, of these images. And in fact, they are also contextualized uh, in the treatment of African Americans and other minority groups in, uh, in the United States. And these are some of the options that, uh, in some cases, these images like these would be intolerable, and yet we uh, still tolerate them on sports teams um, that uh, represent uh, Indians uh, as their mascots. Now, we have to understand, by the way, that not all Indians feel the same way. That there are, in, fe in fact, Native Americans who feel that the uh, sports mascot it honors their traditions and honors their, their past. For example, the Florida State Seminoles has entered into a, uh, uh, a pact between the university and the, and the tribe, um, which, in fact, um, allows the university to use, uh, to continue to use their mascot and their imagery uh, as, uh, as part of its uh, uh, academic identity. Uh, but Seminoles in other parts of the country, in fact, find this uh, radically offensive. So, sociologists actually talk about cultural appropriation and appreciation as if they were on a continuum, on a spectrum. On the one hand, you have uh, cultural proficiency. You have this idea that, in fact, uh, societies understand each other, respect each other, and in fact meet each other's needs in a mutual process of, res uh, of respect and cooperation. But at the very end, at the other end of the spectrum, you have cultural destructiveness. And that includes things like forced assimilation, subjugation of rights, and the dominant culture asserting its privilege over and against any uh, minority, any minority group. And then of course, there, there's a gradation in between those extremes. I think that we can see appreciation and, and appropriation on that spectrum. And it's incumbent on all of us to ask ourselves when our activities, um, our, our views of culture, whether we are in fact a part of minority culture or part of the majority, whether we're not participating in appreciation uh, and or appropriation. And I do believe that when these, uh, um, when these issues polarize and divide the country, that there are, in fact, uh, solutions. The first one begins with respect. We have to, in fact, respect traditional societies. We have to respect that they have, in fact, much to give, but it is their prerogative to share or not. It's not a member of the majority's right to expect or to demand um, access to traditional society's culture. And we must also walk with a certain amount of humility, not just respect, but also humility. We can't presume that we can speak for others. That means white people speaking for brown people and vice versa, but also brown people speaking for other brown people. In other words, we shouldn't presume that any of us can speak for any other group. There is, in fact, a world of information about global peoples out there. And as members of the human family, we should all have access to that, uh, to, the, to that history, that legacy, those cultures. But it is not free. We must learn, in fact, to ask first, to listen. And if we belong to a privileged majority, to expect to be denied, to expect to not like the content, and to expect to have to pay for it. And that's part of respecting um, uh, traditional societies. So I think these are just a few so, uh, possible solutions. Uh, it's a beginning to a much richer and much more important conversation that needs to happen in our country today. Thank you for your attention.